Welcome to the Therapy Show Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. In each episode, I interview a seasoned and knowledgeable talk therapist from the counseling world to glean valuable insights, techniques, and tools that you can apply to your practice and your life. And if you're considering a career in the counseling field or just want to hear about what it's like to be a talk therapist, then this is the podcast for you. Let me take you back. It's 2005, and I'm a fresh faced marriage and family therapy intern at the University of South Carolina's Counseling and Human Development Center. I'm surrounded by interns from other disciplines, and my supervisors are some of the best in the city and probably state when it comes to counseling psychology. To say I'm a little intimidated yet fascinated is an understatement. I couldn't wait to get to my internship every day. We had the coolest setup. I'd see clients for a few hours, then we'd have group supervision, then depending on the day, we'd have more supervision. Yet my favorite type of supervision was when we'd spend time with each clinician and get to pick their brains on anything and all the things we wanted. And this is when I first met Dr. Ray and Mark, and we've kept our friendship going since then. Dr. Mark is an expert at treating eating disorders, and today she talks about the basics and understanding them. Eating disorders may be deemed one of the more difficult diagnoses to treat, but Dr. Mark gives us insight into the symptoms, treatment ideas, and also her thoughts and mine on disordered eating. Our hope is that you walk away with a better understanding, ways to conceptualize treatment, and possibly taking a look at your own views on dieting and our culture around food. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Therapy Show. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard, and today I have a very special guest, a woman that I've admired for many, many years. Um, I'd call her a mentor. I'd call her probably a coach on some levels, and I think she's actually done some great supervision for me over the past. I don't know how long I've been a therapist now, right? 12, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to have her on here. Her name is Dr. Ray Ann Mark. And before I let her say hello, I want to read you her biography. So Dr. Ray Ann Mark has worked in the field of mental health for over 32 years. An alumnus of the University of South Carolina, she received her PhD in psychology from the University of North Texas and has maintained a private practice in Columbia since 1996. She has worked in hospital inpatient and outpatient settings, university counseling centers, has been the director of training for the pre-doc psychology internship program at the USC Counseling and Human Development Center, which is where she and I first met, and currently teaches undergraduates at the University of South Carolina. Go Gamecocks! She previously served the vice chair of the Board of Examiners in Psychology in South Carolina, as well as on the board of directors of NAMI. While her practice is general in nature, she especially enjoys working with adolescents, families, people with eating disorders, and adults navigating major life transitions. Professionally, she is interested in ethics, mind-body health practices, and early career mentoring. And currently, she teaches abnormal psych, the psychology of personality, and the psychology of marriage. Her philosophy for teaching is psychology is life. She has begun a weekly blog with her therapist friend, Lim Squared, which stands for Life is Messy, Life is Marvelous, and offers skills for managing life. And in her free time, Dr. Murph enjoys yoga, painting, camping, gardening, live music, and anything that brings her together with her friends and family. So welcome, Dr. Ray Ann Murph. So happy Thank to you, have Lisa. you. It's, I'm happy to be here. This is so exciting. I feel like kind of coming full circle for me. You've helped me so much over the years and I'm just so excited and grateful to have you here. And before we jump into all of this, I know somewhat of how you got into the field of psychology, but I love your background and I love the story about how you found psychology as your profession. Thank you, Lisa. It's it's a great pleasure to be here and it's been a long time since we worked together. Yeah. So this is fun. It's always fun to to meet up with former colleagues again. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I had a background in dance. I was a dancer in high school and suffered an injury and realized out of that that I was going to need to shift what I was doing and or my plans for college. And I had been very interested in working with kids with developmental disabilities and dance in the form of dance. And so I started looking into that and people said, oh, you'll have to major in early education or elementary education. 
And I kept thinking, but that's not what I want to do. So I went to USC and went to the orientation for education. And I looked around. You've probably heard me tell this story before. But I looked around. I was wearing my jeans and cowboy boots and knowing me, probably a white shirt. And I looked around. All these girls were in jumpers and flats and little Peter Pan collars. And I thought, these are not my people. And so I left. And I walked over to the psychology building. And I changed my major that day. And Mm -hmm. it's just been a great path ever since. That's so cool. I love that story. And I, I'm so grateful that you picked psychology because honestly, I don't think I would be here if it weren't for your help back in the day. So for, I just want to share how you and I really know each other is when I was in graduate school doing my internship, I did my internship at the University of South Carolina Counseling Center. And Dr. Merck was, she was doing the training program for the pre-doc psychology students. And while I was a marriage and family therapy student, we all kind of got to hang together. We all got to train together. And we just really had an amazing, amazing clinical experience with you and Dr. Russell Haber and Dr. Pete Liggett. I mean, it just, I feel like I was so lucky to, to have mentored and been under your tutelage for that year, really. And then went on and became more like colleagues and peers when I actually got a job there and started working with you. And that was really cool. Right. And friends. And friends. I know. (laughs) It's been a while since we've seen each other, but yes. I think that's why this is so much fun. It just feels very comfortable and very familiar. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, let's talk a little bit about why you are here today, which is to talk about eating disorders and treatment. Would you kind of back it up a little bit? Can you share how you got into specializing in that? Absolutely. So my first job after I got my bachelor's degree from USC in psychology was I eventually got a job on an inpatient psychiatric unit. And this was in the very early 80s. And it was quite interesting because most people would be appalled today because we had adults, males, females, people who were detoxing from drugs, people with chronic schizophrenia, people with debilitating depression. We also had adolescents and children on that unit, believe it or not. So everybody was lumped in together, which is pretty unheard of today. So within several months of my being there, and I always picked out the kids to work with as much as possible, and we had to obviously keep a close eye on them in that milieu, I met a psychiatrist who was a child and adolescent psychiatrist, Dr. Richard Harding, and he had trained in the treatment of eating disorders during his residency up at Johns Hopkins. So he started a unit, Children's Hospital here in Columbia was brand new at that point, and he started a very small eight-bed open unit for kids with psychosomatic illnesses. So we had folks who had genetic disorders, what we think of now as internalizing disorders, kids who had debilitating anxiety with somatic symptoms, or we had sometimes some of the chemo kids who weren't adapting well to some of their treatments and just all kinds of very, very unusual things. In the process, he was also treating folks with eating disorders who were predominantly young people, um, early adolescents, all the way through college. But occasionally, because the setup was so perfect for this. We even got adult women in that treatment setting. And we became a referral place, a treatment facility for people with eating disorders throughout the Southeast. We had people from Atlanta, people from other parts of Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee, particularly and we're pretty successful in that setting. It was very small setting, very personalized treatment. And it was back in the days before managed care. So we were able to take people into this treatment setting and keep them for a really uh, good period of time so that they uh, had adequate rate, weight restoration and made emotional progress. And then we were able to follow them once they came out of uh, the inpatient setting. We treated those folks and it was very personalized treatment and we got to know our patients extremely well. Okay. And then from there, did you transfer more into private practice? So I had been there for a while and Dr. Harding ended up with way too many people that he couldn't follow up with in his private practice. So I began to see some of these girls that I knew pretty well as follow-up 
therapy through his office. And after doing that for a couple of years, I thought, I really need to go to graduate school. (laughs) And eventually, my husband and I at the time moved to Texas, and I got into the University of North Texas and went to graduate school, then came back here to Columbia to resettle and, and build my practice after I finished my degree. Oh, okay, cool. That's really neat. Yeah. I didn't realize, I knew, I knew you went to North Texas, but I didn't realize how you had, you know, done that. So that's, okay, learn something new every day. So yeah, let, let's much talk. later. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love that. How old were you when you got your PhD, just out of curiosity? Well, I started when I was 30, so I was okay. 36 when I finished. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so. so that's really good encouragement for those listening out there that are wondering if it's too late for them to pursue a PhD or a master's degree or, you know, never. It's never too late. It, it's it, never too late. Yeah, right. Never. It's <laughs> never too late. You know, I was mentored at the time by a female psychiatrist who had been a pharmacist prior to going back to medical school. And she didn't go back till she was 40. And she said, I kept asking myself, golly, you know, I'll be, you know, 47 or 48 between I, before I get completely finished. And she said, but then I realized I would be that age regardless, never right. having done it. So exactly. that was a really great inspiration. And, you know, in hindsight, 30 is not old at all. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I know. But it's cool. It's cool. And it's good to know that about that, you know, pharmacist turned psychiatrist as well. It's, mm-hmm. And, I, and I, tr- I truly believe that the more life experiences you have, the better before you go into this field. I, I truly, now that I'm at a certain age, I get it. I get it. I like right, it. right. Exactly. I have young students who aren't sure and they're not quite ready to take it on. And I'm like, don't go out and live a little, you know, have, have some life experience behind you because it always, we always benefit in our field from that. Oh yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the three major eating disorders that more than likely would pop up if somebody were to present themselves to your office. Right. So the two main ones are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. In 2013, when the DSM-5 came out, they had added binge eating disorder. I see a little bit less of that, and and I can comment on that if you would like at some point. But the main two, when we think traditionally about eating disorders, we think of anorexia and bulimia. And sometimes parts of the treatment are very similar. And there are other parts of treatment that require obviously a different sort of emphasis because of the behaviors involved. But a lot of the thinking sometimes is largely similar. And if I were to start with one thought for any therapist who's beginning to think about working with people with eating disorders, it would be the idea that an eating disorder is a coping mechanism. It is always a way that a person has found to cope. And the problem with coping mechanisms is that they oftentimes work for a while until they begin to take on a life of their own. Once that begins to happen, then they become problematic in their ability to manage whatever they started as, and you know this as, as from your training in family therapy, whatever it was intended to fix it's no longer adequate for that. So that's generally how they start. Um, So if you'd like, we can start with kind of the diagnostic criteria of anorexia and then bulimia and look at exactly what differentiates the two of them, because at times they really do have overlap. And there are times that people cycle into one and then the other and then back to the first one. And it can be it can be kind of a fluid course. So it's not exactly, absolutely, if you have anorexia, you have anorexia. If you have bulimia, you have bulimia. Sometimes people are engaging in some degree of both behaviors. So anorexia nervosa, it basically has three primary diagnostic criteria, which have changed over the years. From the when I first started, we were using the DSM three, then of course the four, and now we're in the five. And I really like the changes, the subtle changes, which have been very important in the diagnostic criteria of anorexia. And I'll break that down a little bit. The first one is the restriction of energy intake. 
So energy intake is calories. A lot of people think calories equal fat, but that's not true. Calorie, uh, kilocalorie is a measure of heat and it is therefore a measure of energy. So it's the restriction of energy intake relative to requirements. So whatever it is that your body needs for you to function optimally, then you are not meeting that requirement, in other words. So the restriction of energy intake relative to requirements leading to a significantly low body weight. Now, in the days of the DSM-3, part of the diagnostic criteria was that you had to have lost 25% of your body weight. But that excluded certain adolescents from that group because some of these adolescents had been very thin to start with and had never truly lost 25% of their body weight. So that was a criteria that was removed that I think is really important. So leading to a significantly low body weight in the context of age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. So you know, there may be a kid that has a, um, or an ally, anyone who has a health condition that creates some difference in weight than we would normally expect because of that health condition. It's also different, say, for example, for athletes who are highly fit, have a very high muscle mass to body fat ratio. And so they're calorie requirement is going to be different based on their performance demands. Age and sex kind of captures that piece of these adolescents maybe that had never been heavy enough to lose 25% of body weight, for example. Sex differences certainly make it, you know, are, are are important in in assessing this. And then this notion of developmental trajectory, because any parent knows, sometimes kids are aware of it, sometimes they're not, but any parent knows that when you take your kid in for a well visit, there's a growth chart that plots their height and weight. And if you've got a height that's increasing on a child and a weight that they haven't lost any, but they haven't gained any, so it's kind of flatlined, relative to their increases in height, it isn't where it should be. So that kind of captures that piece of developmental trajectory. So what are we expecting from that kid's growth pattern? Any thoughts about that or questions? No, I think I I like how you kind of, you know, talk about where it was and how it's evolved over the years. I think it's really helpful. It's Mm -hmm, good to know. mm -hmm. Well, and I think they've done a really good job of capturing nuance in that, Mm -hmm. that the old criteria did not. As a part of that criteria, it says significantly low body weight is defined as a weight that's less than minimally normal or for children and adolescents less than minimally expected. So it captures that idea of the trajectory. The second criteria is a very important piece, intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain even though at a significantly low body weight. So the fear of gaining or becoming fat, sometimes a person is aware of that and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're so highly defended that they won't admit that that is, and, and not that they are just refusing to admit, but that they can't see it and cannot admit that that is one of the motivations for not being of normal weight. But then they throw in this piece or persistent behavior that interferes with weight gain, even though it is significantly low weight. And that's the piece that's really critically important is whether the person feels like they're motivated consciously in that way or not. Sometimes people have behaviors that are creating obstacles. So Whether you admit it or not, know it or not, doesn't really matter if you have those persistent behaviors. Right. So it sounds like there's a little bit possibly, would you call it denial in in the patient? 
I mean, yes. Okay. And, you know, one of the interesting things I think about denial is we use it in such a colloquial sort of way, such as a kind of a common way of, you know, someone denies something because they, they are aware of it, but they're lying. But mm-hmm. it's important to remember that denial really is a defense mechanism mm-hmm. and defense mechanisms by definition are unconscious processes. Right. So right. the person really, truly can't see it and denies it. But yeah, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you made that that specification because you, there's a lot of people that I've encountered and maybe you've encountered the family members are like, how could they be in denial? How could they be in denial? And it's, it's, they are, I mean, they just, that's, they just can't see it. Right. Can't see it. And that's hard for family members. Really hard. Right. Or it's the point that people turn it into a character problem. So they'll say things like, um, well, you know, she's just lying about it. Right. Well, she's really not intentionally lying about it if she can't see it. And if unconsciously, it's just, it's not available to her. So, yeah. Yeah. It is an important distinction, though, because people start to feel like someone with an eating disorder is difficult. And to some degree, they are difficult, but not because they have a character problem or they're trying to be difficult. It really is just the nature of the disorder. Yes. Oh, yes. So the third one is disturbance in the way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced. So that's that thing that we think of sort of classically with someone who has anorexia, who sees themselves as fat, but doesn't recognize how thin they are. So that's a disturbance in the in body image, basically. Undue influence of body weight or shape on self-evaluation. That piece, oftentimes people have a very long, distorted narrative about how life would be better if they were just a few pounds thinner. Mm -hmm. I'll be smarter. I'll make better grades. Someone will love me more. My friends will accept me better. I'll be a true rock star then. You know, Mm -hmm. they have all of these ideas about how who they are depends on the number on the scale. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece of this third criteria is a persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. We, over the years in that small uh, behavioral unit, we had folks who had extraordinarily low body weight, shockingly low body weight, who would just look at us deadpan and say, oh, I know it's a little low, but I'm fine. I'm totally fine when any lay person could glance at them or might notice them walking down the street and say, clearly you are not fine. So that's that lack of recognition about how serious it can be. Mm -hmm. So there's different types of anorexia. Um, We think of it primarily as a restrictive disorder. There can be a binge eating and purging type, but that's generally when the person's hunger, their sense of starvation takes over and they eat something and then have all this cognitive regret about it and then will do something to purge the food afterwards. But the primary operational piece in that is still the anorexia, not the binging and purging, which we more classically think of as bulimia. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So then bulimia, again, there are just a few criteria here, which have been a little bit refined over the years. So the first is recurrent episodes of binge eating, and an episode of binge eating is characterized by both of the following, and that is eating in a discrete period of time an amount of food that's definitely larger than what most individuals would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. So it has to do with not someone who's snacking and grazing all day long, but it's a period of time that's rather encapsulated, if you will. So I start now and I finish then, you know, and it's, it's an hour, it's 30 minutes or whatever it might be. And then the second part of it is a sense of lack of control over eating during that time. And really and truly, if you talk to people, sometimes they will describe being completely out of it and not even 
really being aware of what they're eating, or if they are, they're telling themselves things like, I should really stop now. I'm full. I shouldn't be eating this. I'm way beyond what is typical or average or necessary, but yet they can't stop. So it kind of captures both of those parts. So that's binge eating. Okay. And then the thing that we think about as purging is recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors in order to prevent weight gain, such as self-induced vomiting, which is the most common one that we think of, Mm -hmm. misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or other medications, fasting, or excessive exercise. So anything inappropriate compensatory behaviors So these people are oftentimes very carefully trying to match exactly what went in and exactly what I am expending so that they can fall into a pattern of being under their requirements and therefore losing weight. The third one, now I have a little personal problem with this criteria, is that binge eating and inappropriate compensatory behaviors both occur on average at least once a week for three months. Now, I think if you are using, let's just say, self-induced vomiting or even laxatives or diuretics for the purpose of weight loss, I have a problem that if you're doing it once a week, it's fine. That message to me I think it's a slippery slope, (laughs) and I think that um, that really ought to be examined. But nonetheless, it's in our criteria. Mm -hmm. And then it has, again, the self-evaluation is unduly influenced by body shape and weight. And then lastly, the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia. So that it's sort of saying, make sure that this is its own standalone disorder. Okay. That's a great overview. It's really helpful. I'm glad you went over that because I know it's changed uh, since I've probably worked in this area of you know expertise. I haven't been in, in this in a while. So as we think about um, understanding eating disorders, what about comorbid conditions? What, what does that look like? Right. So there's several important things. First of all, I said at the beginning that this is importantly a coping mechanism or most importantly a coping mechanism. And so when you start to look at what is it a coping mechanism for, oftentimes the most common comorbid uh, diagnoses would be some type of anxiety and or some type of mood disorder, pretty much most commonly being depression. So I've really had to sit and think at times if I've ever known anyone who had an eating disorder that didn't have some degree of anxiety that drives it and or depression. And certainly if you go with restricted type of intake for any period of time, over time you will become depressed. There's no doubt about that. But oftentimes what really is driving this is anxiety. And so a lot of clinicians will start to focus on the eating itself, which of course is important, but then they neglect the underlying anxiety. And so any anxiety treatments or strategies that we generally think of can be helpful for a person with an eating disorder. And another interesting one that came up, I don't know, maybe about a decade ago, is that there is a very high comorbidity rate between bulimia and ADHD. So women with ADHD are at far higher risk for experiencing symptoms of bulimia, even if they don't have a full-blown diagnosis. And it has to do with that impulsivity or that not thinking ahead. I mean, sometimes a lot of us in just sort of general, you know, life skills will say, oh, but wait, I'm going to that party tonight. You know, it's probably going to be snacky food. So I think I'll have a salad at lunch or, you know, trying to balance your nutrition. And someone with bulimia will make, I'm sorry, someone with ADHD will make a very impulsive decision that doesn't look down the road at future consequences like any other manifestation of ADHD. Mm -hmm. And then when they've 
cross the line in their own mind, then they'll say, oh my goodness, I feel miserable. Let me do something about that. And so impulsively, they will use some of those inappropriate compensatory behaviors. So that's been a really interesting finding. And it's important to assess someone with bulimia for ADHD because a lot of young women go undiagnosed with their ADHD, even into early adulthood. And if you start to treat that, it can really help the treatment of bulimia. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Could you talk a little bit about addictions and eating disorders? Yeah, you know that's a whole. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> a whole. A can worm. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting because there have been over over time. I mean, that. Let me back up. That behavioral unit for kids where we treated eating disorders was we started that in the early to mid '80s, and at the time you know, everybody was out there kind of doing their own thing. And as a matter of fact, I think it was probably 1985, I went to the second international conference on eating disorders, which was held up in Ohio. And, you know, we got together and people were like, oh, you're doing this? Gosh, we're doing that. Oh, well, how about this? You know, we haven't thought about that. So it was really a period of time where everybody was sort of their own, kind of in their own bubble out there trying to figure it out by themselves. And at the time, also, there was a lot of talk about food as an addiction. And so there were a lot of people in the addiction field who took on, say, for example, bulimia. And there's no doubt that there is something about people with eating disorders. We know this now. There's a genetic difference that there are a lot of people for whom starvation really lights up their dopamine system so that they feel good. There are other people for whom starvation makes them crumble. You know, if you're hypoglycemic at all or, you know, have a certain makeup, then, you know, not eating is really not rewarding in any way. So there are There are people who think about certain aspects of eating disorders as an addiction. And I do have patients who have had addiction problems across the board and eating becomes one of them. So what I would say is it's something to certainly screen for and think about. And I think that for people who have addictions, or even they will say, a, you know, quote unquote, addictive personality, they are probably at greater risk for developing a problem with food. But I don't necessarily think, and I'd have to check the literature, but I don't necessarily think that people with eating disorders are at higher risk for developing addiction problems, except in the case, perhaps, of untreated, unrecognized people with ADHD who also have bulimia, because we know that people with ADHD also have a higher risk of substance use problems. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh, it gets me thinking so much about past cases and, you know, interesting. It's really, really interesting. It's, you know, so much of what we do is like, we're like detectives putting things together. And when we talk with people, we sit down and we hear their stories and we hear what's going on and their challenges and their struggles and their family history. I mean, there's so much that goes into with this work and helping people that I'm always reminded. It's, it's just, it's just great to sit here with you and hear you explain all this because it, nothing is never linear. Nothing is never um, a equal plus B equals C. And there's so many things that go into a diagnosis and there's so many things that go into helping a person with treatment. You can't just cookie cutter approach every client or patient that walks in the door. So right, this, is right. Super, this is really helpful. Well, and you raise a really important point. I can tell you back at that conference, people were still looking for the cause of an eating disorder. And what I can tell you is all these years later, you know, 30 plus years later, Uh, There is no one cause, but I think of it as being in five domains or five realms of a person. And for me, when I train people to work with folks with eating disorders now, I tell them that you are going to have to be a very good integrative 
therapist or eclectic mm-hmm. therapist because you cannot approach it from a singular direction and expect that to work. Mm-hmm. So the five areas are the physical part, the physiology of it, mm-hmm. the psychological part, obviously the you know cognitive and, and emotional aspects of it. There are the familial aspects of mm-hmm. this, and you're exactly right. And when I ask people to think about it, what I the the language I use is what is the culture of food, weight, dieting, exercise, though all those things in a particular family. So mm-hmm. what's the culture of food in the family? And then there's the social aspects. I mean, we all know that everything in print media has been altered. There's mm-hmm. not a single image that has not been photoshopped in print media. And it's very subtle and it's hard for our eye to pick up on the subtle changes that they make in people's bodies and their appearance that when you really study it are very um, abnormal looking, like mm-hmm. these really long necks right. or really long extended legs. And yet it sets up for our brain an image that when we look in the mirror, we expect to see, but no one looks like that because it's all been altered. Right. Right. So that's an important piece. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the fifth realm is the nutritional realm. And you cannot untangle the nutritional realm from the cognitive and emotional stuff. So that brings up the point that you always have to work with a team Mm -hmm. in treating someone with an eating disorder. To work with a nutritionist is a registered dietitian, particularly someone who has experience in treating someone with an eating disorder. It's critically important. And because otherwise, sometimes a registered dietitian will just take a standard diet and say, here, do this. It's really simple. And the person goes, but no, no, you don't understand. It's not simple at all. And that's true. Right. So working with a dietitian and also a physician who can follow their health closely if they're kind of on a critical edge and hopefully a psychiatrist who may need to prescribe some of the medications to treat the underlying depression and anxiety for the person. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a team-based effort. It is, it is an effort. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Can you think of another mental health condition that requires so much teamwork? I'm trying to think of. You know, um, I mean, usually you're dealing with a psychiatrist pretty much exclusively. I really can't. And, you know, it's interesting because my early work history and training was always in a team sort of setting. Mm -hmm. And we even had family therapists that we trained with and that we brought into that unit. And so having people look at an individual from all different directions, from, you know, a 360 perspective walking all the way around them is yeah I can't I can't think of anything else offhand yeah and I like that I like having people to Mm -hmm. bat ideas around and consult with Mm -hmm. and I work with a really good registered dietitian here in town and and our mutual clients will come in and say oh well she said exactly that same thing or you just use the same words she did or she just used the same exact words that you did and um I can really count on her because I always know we're on the same page yeah that's cool that you have somebody a colleague that is so mm-hmm. similar that's really neat mm-hmm. I think that's awesome okay well this is this is really incredible I'm I'm getting so much out of this if, I'm excited to keep going. So tell us about, yeah, yeah. So the next learning objective, participants will be familiar with the role that weight, weight loss, calorie level, and calorie level have on emotional and cognitive functioning. This is really important. Like this really- is really important. And this is a little tidbit that, I mean, certainly people that work in the eating disorder world know about this, but I don't think that the average therapist knows about this. And let me say this, there are a lot of therapists, very good therapists who just kind of will toss up their hands and say, I really um, can't work with someone with an eating disorder. And it does take 
a lot of confidence in yourself and being clear about what your own eating issues are mm-hmm. that might clutter it. Mm-hmm. I've had innumerable clients come to me over time who said, well, I told this one therapist that I was having this pro- problem and the person said, oh, you look fine to me. Gosh, I wish I looked like you did or something of that nature. I know, I I know Lisa is uh, just like face planted on the table, but um, yeah, it it is so discouraging because it takes so much for the client to recognize it. So there's this little, well, some people know about it, but there was a a study that was published actually in 1950 by a researcher whose name was Ansel Keys, Key, or Keys, and he was the person who made the connection between diet. He was actually a dietitian and a researcher, and he is the person who made the connection between what we eat and heart disease particularly atherosclerosis. And he was studying the effects of starvation on the body following World War II, which of course Mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. So he had a group of volunteers of conscientious objectors who were still, you know, needing to pay their debt to the country by some type of service. So he asked for volunteers to participate in this rather lengthy study And let's see, so he had over 300 volunteers, and of those, he picked out the most physically healthy and psychologically healthy young men, because they were all young men, and ended up with 36 volunteers. So he only took the, you know, the very cream of the crop, the top Mm -hmm. 10% or so. And this is called, you can look it up, it's called the Minnesota Semi-Starvation Study. Mm -hmm. And what they essentially did, and I hope I get the numbers right since we're recording this for perpetuity, (laughs) but um, he basically observed them for six months. And he had a whole team of people who watched their food habits, their exercise habits, their emotional selves, their thoughts, everything about them and recorded. He had just amazingly detailed notes on every single individual in the study. So they watched them for six months and then they cut their calories in half for the next three months. And most of the men lost 25% of their body weight. Mm -hmm. And then they refed them for three months, and then they continued to follow them off-site throughout their normal lives for about the next nine months. And the point of this is that when you read the accounts of these men, once they lost that 25% of their body weight, and that as they as their weight was plummeting, they, if you were to read this, they sound like 16-year-old girls with anorexia. So they were checking their body in the mirror. They were talking about how thin they were. They started exercising a lot. They were counting calories. They were collecting recipes. They started collecting random things that had to do with food. They had a lot of the eating behaviors that you see in people with severe anorexia who chop up their food in tiny little bites and push it around on the plate. And they added like extreme flavors to it, like hot sauce or tons of pepper and things like that, which are things that we see people do in extreme cases of anorexia. It's just a really remarkable study on the cognitive and emotional effects of starvation. And they they also had an increase, many of them in depressive symptoms, mm-hmm as well as anxiety. Some of them who had not been like this before developed OCD-like rituals. I mean, it's really amazing. You know, it's not a study that we could do anymore ethically. (laughs) Um, And yet it's so telling. So kind of the moral of the story on that is that you can be someone who we would not ordinarily think of as being at risk. And if you push your body too hard, if you have that ongoing 
deficit of calories over a period of time and start to lose too much too fast, or you drop below a certain weight, you too can develop these cognitive and emotional changes. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen with patient after patient after patient over the years is most people have sort of a magical line, if you will, that if they drop below it, their thinking becomes completely irrational about food and weight and eating. And once they get back above the line, they can think more clearly again, and they're not nearly as obsessive about that. And in fact, sometimes people will look back and go, I have no idea why in the world I was thinking like that or doing those things. Wow. That's that's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Very telling, very, very telling. Yeah. And and what we've seen in recent years are students who show up at a large university like ours and, you know, they might be from rural communities where, you know, people are still eating everything fried and they get to a university and they go, wow, I'm going to really clean up my act. You know, I'm going to start exercising and watching what I eat. And the net result is they lose really quickly. And then they come in and say, but I'm not that anorexic girl. You know, I realize I'm too thin, but yet I can't seem to eat more. So it's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And I, and I also, just from the clients I've had over the years, I kind of think I like the opposite student the student and, and and I think student because that's where you and I work together. This is where uh-huh. where I kind of saw, you know, eating disorder behavior. The, mm-hmm. the student that comes in who's over who's very high achiever, who takes a maybe an extra class every semester, is working really hard to maintain that GPA, has that type A personality and realizes what they're doing, you know, but yet at the same time, they don't they don't stop because it's that like I have to maintain what I have created. It's really important for me to to maintain this because I get praised. I get the job. I get the the position in my leadership. I get, you know, it's rewarding for me to stay in this pretty little box, but yet I'm not really happy. And right. That's, that's mm-hmm. difficult too, you know. And that's that, that's that, you know, the influence of weight on your self-evaluation. You know, mm-hmm. that's that piece of it right there. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, 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 you know, I remember you telling me back, back in the day when I was a <laughs> intern, I remember us having, you know, I think we even did like a group at one time, you know, kind of like supervision of these, these clients, patients. And you said, you know, One thing I want you all, and you even mentioned this, but one thing I want you all to know is you have to be very aware of your own ideas about health, your own ideas about nutrition, your own ideas about your body image, and you have to be very clear about your own stuff. Exactly. And and Mm -hmm. so when you mentioned that woman earlier or whoever that other therapist was, that made me kind of cringe a little bit because that's so important in, if you're going to work with these, this population is you have to be very aware of your own behavior and of your own thoughts around food and and all that stuff. Right. And it really speaks to the idea of, do we really have a normal Mm -hmm. or is disordered our normal in this country? So for example, you know, when they go out and interview women on the street, are you happy with your body? You know, more than 85% of them will say no. And there is more misinformation, more diet myths and health myths. I mean, you know, eat carbs, don't eat carbs, eat meat, don't eat meat, blah, 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 blah. You know, it just is unceasing Mm -hmm. these, you know, and they're always presented as absolute rules when in fact they're, you know, or or should we go eat McDonald's every day or not to pick on McDonald's, but, you know, highly processed foods. No, we should, you know, eat foods that are closer to their original source than that in, you know, in an effort to be healthy, but is it going to kill you occasionally if you're on a road trip and the group stops and that's all that's available and, you know, Western Kansas or something. I mean, you, you right. only have what you have. And right. so can you eat to feed your body in a way that can be flexible based on other circumstances? That's such, it's such sound advice, such sound advice. I love it. 
I love it. And I laugh because, and I kind of like kind of roll my eyes a little bit because over here in the mustard home, we're very invested on health and wellness and nutrition. Mm -hmm. But I got, you know, this past weekend, our daughter had her gymnastics meet and I'm very much about refueling your body with good stuff, you know, after, Mm -hmm. but the only thing Mm -hmm. available at 1030 at night was a Wendy's drive through. And I said, let's just do it. And and you just get some calories in you. And tomorrow, you know, healthy breakfast, we're back, we're back on track. And Mm -hmm. you know, it, it is, that whole idea of the moderation and the balance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's what we want and, our, cli- our clients to find. You know, we really want our clients to find. Right. And what we often see in that, you know, you were mentioning it with that, you know, prototype student that you were talking about is all that sort of perfectionism underlying that there's a perfect way to do this or a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. That black and white thinking Mm -hmm. is a piece uh, in treatment of someone with an eating disorder that we constantly have to challenge. There, there is no good food, bad food. Are there some that are preferable? You know, yes. But, you know, you can also argue that a steady diet of just carrots is not going to be good for you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it takes a variety. It does. And so let's, let's kind of go into that direction a little bit. Well, you have on your participants will understand key diagnostic issues that guide treatment form- formulation. I think that's kind of where we're headed with what we're talking about right now. But I also want us to cover the important role that adjunct therapies provide in holistic treatments for eating disorders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and we kind of covered that one Mm -hmm. with the nutritionist Mm -hmm. or registered dietitian and so forth. You know, I, I also have another registered dietitian who used to work um, in our athletic department at USC and was an athlete herself and understands the specific needs of athletes. And, you know, there are some treatment programs that will completely restrict a person's activity in an effort to improve their weight gain. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that. I know there's a time when that's called for, and I know there are times when people cannot self-regulate on mm-hmm. that. But I also think that we're meant to move mm-hmm. and we should move, even if it's, you know, sending these girls out to go take a walk with their parents, you know, but, but having people who can really help with that or, Um, I send a lot of people, I have a friend and colleague who has a group for a yoga class on yoga for anxiety and how to, you know, begin to help regulate that overall level of anxiety through a yoga practice, which is outstanding, you know, so I I think we've covered some of that. And Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important in terms of creating a diagnostic sort of or a diagnostic tool in order to create sort of what your plan is. I have several things and I I just want to mention quickly that I do. And by and large, I want to say that we really try to avoid talking about numbers Mm -hmm. with the individual because the number becomes a sort of black and white concrete symbol for the person that translates into good and bad but their good and bad is the opposite of our good and bad. If the weight's going down for them, that's good. If the weight, you know, and so we might say, oh, you're doing good, which means, you know, whatever it means to them. And then they think, oh, well, that's bad. So then I have to dig in harder and, and do more behaviors to, to change that. So we really try to avoid all that language. You know, the standard in the business is to weigh people with their back to the to the scale. And it's a real fine line on how you let someone know if they're making progress or not. That's why it really takes a skilled registered dietitian who works in this field to know how to navigate that. And I had a dietitian one time who's, who basically said, the patient bullied me until I told him the number, you know, <laughs> I'm like, well, your job is not to tell him the number, <laughs> but the person just didn't have a lot of experience in the area. Um, but there's one exception to this numbers rule and that's on the initial assessment. So I do an initial assessment that looks at, and it, it's a little bit different if you're working with a teenager than if you're working with an adult. So I'll start with adults. But one of the questions I ask people or the series of questions is, first of all, how tall are you? and What is your weight now? Then secondly, what is your lowest adult weight? In other words, since you've been an adult, not 
even if you were five, six at 13 years old and you're five, six now at 35, we want an adult weight because women are different than girls. So we'll ask them, what is your lowest adult non-pregnant weight? Um, to get an idea of where sort of the bottom edge of this has been before. And then what's, and, and when was that? And then what is your highest adult weight, non-pregnant weight? So we want to know how far, you know, what's the upper limit of what this person has experienced. And then I ask them, if you could pick any weight as your ideal weight, what is your ideal weight? Because that gives you an idea of how distorted their thinking is. In some ways, it's less about the number, but more about the distortion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask them if they've been in treatment before or consulted with a dietitian. What is the weight or weight range? Because we usually talk about a range with a person because that's normal. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the weight range that you've been given as ideal for you? And that gives you sort of a, where did this begin? How high has it gotten? How low has it gotten? Where are you now? What is your thinking about this? Sometimes people will say, it, you know, they'll give a very normal weight, like an ideal range that they've been given, and they will know, yeah, that's where I should be. That's my ideal weight. Sometimes they give you something that's way below that. Sometimes it's just below that. It just gives you sort of a snapshot of where their thinking is more than anything. Now, by and large, I really don't talk with people about numbers, but in the beginning, it's really pretty critical to get that assessment. So, yeah. Now, if you're working with an adolescent, what I'll usually say is since you've been this height, what's been your lowest weight and what's been your highest weight, that sort of thing. And what do you consider ideal? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, cool. And then when you think about treatment, we talked a little bit about being integrated and eclectic in how you treat eating disorders. Can you share a little bit about the, the way that you integrate as, as, as a psychologist working with the client? Right, right. So I almost laughed when you said that because I'm like, I go wherever it's yeah. hot. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, I do try to check in with people about, you know, how their mood's been, how their anxiety's been, how, you know, how they're navigating food. But, you know, lots of times people come in with what's going on in their world in that moment. Sometimes it's family stressors, sometimes it is things at school, social stressors, but I'm always looking for what's the interaction between their circumstances, their thinking, their emotional life, and how they're managing food. Because again, the food is the, it's the coping mechanism. So I will use a lot of cognitive behavioral strategies at times. You know, I can't say I don't believe in cognitive behavioral therapy because, of course, I do. And challenging mm -hmm. some of those thinking patterns or distorted thoughts or the idea that if I was just thinner, that boy would notice me. Or if I were thinner, I would be more successful in school. But then I also, and you know this about me, I am trained as in, in my thinking a lot as a family therapist. And so I'm always, always considering the person in the context of their family life, their social situation, understanding, again, the culture of the family around food and weight and eating. I mean, that's our early training. Mm -hmm. And if it's very black and white or if it has rigid rules, those are important things to begin to challenge by helping a person rethink that perspective. So for example, I had a client one time whose mother, I'm pretty sure the mother had said that in her early life, she had hadn't, yeah, she did. She, in her early life, she had had an eating disorder when she was a young person. Now this this particular client was, I don't know, let's just say 30-ish roughly. <laughs> But when she had been a child, her grandmother, when there was a family get-together for a holiday, for Thanksgiving, for 
Christmas, whatever, the grandmother would take all of the girl cousins and line them up and have them step on the scale, weigh them and critique them about their weight since the last visit to her house. Now, I don't know about you, if I'm 15 and my grandmother does that in the context of all these other girls, it was a pretty big family, and then we're supposed to go sit down and eat Thanksgiving dinner, I can't help but have my thinking disrupted about what this is all about, you know? Mm -hmm. all right. And those are very real circumstances. It is not uncommon at this point in time to have young women who are third generation eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I might add, it is not always the mothers. Sometimes it's the fathers. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've just seen that in clients in the past and I've seen that in my, in my peer group, you know, I've seen that mm -hmm. with my friends and my girlfriends and we all have experiences that imprint on us when it comes to food, when it comes to body image as women and men too, but you know, being that we're women that mm -hmm. happen to us when we are young and good, bad, and different intentions, we come away with meaning making experiences and we take that and we put it on ourselves and we take it forward with us and we just we protect it. Yep. And yep. It's exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, we've all got stuff, you know, we've all got stuff. Some of us just take our stuff, unfortunately, to, coping mechanisms and mm -hmm. coping skills mm -hmm. that if they get in the way of life functioning healthy, normal, then it can be a, a struggle and a challenge. Mm -hmm. and, a problem. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, you know, my hope today is maybe there's somebody listening who is like, you know, when she was Dr. Mark was talking about the, the criteria for those disorders, I'm, I'm hearing myself a little bit. So if you're listening today and you hear yourself in any of us, please reach out for support. Please reach out to get some help. You know, you can, there's, Nowadays, there's so many counselors and therapists and psychologists that are trained in this field and in this subject that there it's not like, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago when right. like it's mm -hmm. it's evolved so much. So, I'm hopeful people listening today if they need support, they will reach out and find somebody that they can talk to and if the person that they reach out to isn't the best fit, keep going until you find the fit. Keep going. Exactly. Exactly. And I oftentimes get people who've seen at least more than one counselor prior to um, showing up at my doorstep. And I have to say, I know probably the over time, but I have to say one thing about that. And mm -hmm. that is that I've had so many people show up who say, when I ask them if they've been in therapy before, I'll ask them, you know, what exactly have you tried in order to make this better, this eating problem better? And more often than not, they'll look at me pretty mystified and confused. Well, what do you mean? Well, what sorts of things have you done to change your behavior or try to make this better? Or what have you talked about in therapy? And more often than not, they'll look at me and say, you oftentimes, I mean, I've had so many break down crying and say, well, I told my counselor and they said, well, once you have an eating disorder, you always have an eating disorder. And they therefore never tried any different behaviors or challenging their thinking in order to be different. Wow. And, you know, I'm here to say that people recover 100% from these disorders. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do this if people never got better. That right. would be a bit fraudulent, in my opinion. Right. Right. But people really, really, really can get completely better. Mm -hmm. I have a former client who about once a year will contact me laughing. She'll go, hey, I got another one for you. And she's, you know, in her, I don't know, thirties or forties now. And, you know, she's sending her peers and she's like, mm -mm, no, this one definitely has a problem. She needs to come talk to you. I've told her she's going to call you, you know? Right. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's incredible. You know, it's, yeah, you can totally recover from something like this. Totally. recover. Absolutely. I mean, there is hope. And the sooner, the younger, the mm -hmm. sooner that you get help, the better the outcome. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Do you have any, just overall, because you're a mom um, and, you know, you've been doing this work for some time. Maybe there's moms listening who, you know, they don't necessarily meet the criteria for eating disorder, but they definitely have some behaviors that they are aware of and they know that they don't want to pass it on to their, their daughters or their sons. Anything that you can throw out there that 
would be good advice or information for them? You know, that's a great, great question because a lot of people fall into a category that you and I would consider subclinical. Mm -hmm. So there are eating disorders, but then there is disordered eating Mm -hmm. and chronic dieting is one of the hallmarks of disordered eating. You know, the conversations that people have, and I swear, honestly, Lisa, right now, I feel like it's at an all time high. And remember, I've been doing this since the 80s, early 80s. Um, But people having ongoing ad nauseum conversations about their diets and how much weight they've lost and you know, on and on and on and what works for you. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I tried this and I tried that and I purchased this program and that program, blah, blah. It just, I'm telling you socially, it just completely makes me weary. And for the most part, I don't engage in it. But a few years ago, I know after Christmas, I was sitting with some therapist friends and they started down that road and i bit my tongue for a little while. And then I just finally thought, I can't stand this. I have such a low tolerance for it that I looked at him and I said, is there not anything else more interesting that we could talk about besides weight loss and dieting? Mm -hmm. And I I just had to kind of remove myself and take a moment. And when I came back, we, you know, surprisingly found much more interesting things to talk about. So challenging yourself, how much am I talking about this? Am I in public and do I make negative comments about how someone looks in front of my daughters? Because if you do that, If you are essentially fat shaming someone else, your daughters are going to hear that and go, ooh, what about me? You know, ooh, are people talking about me? Well, I don't kind of don't like my fill in the blank, stomach hips, whatever. And is someone saying that about me? Because those are the early seeds of it. Right. Yeah, that's really wise. I'm so glad you brought that up. I know that I have uh, one of my expertise areas is helping women find what works for them when it comes to reaching their, you know, healthy lifestyle goals. Mm -hmm. And I spend so much time, so much time talking about chronic dieting and what it's actually doing to the body versus just eating healthy and just finding that formula that works for you because we're all so, and I could go on for hours about that, but, and we won't do that right now, but it's, you're so right. And it's, it is like, I get tired of talking about it (laughs) myself. So I, I just like, Oh, you're right. Let's talk about like what, let's build your confidence up instead of like talking about things that are uh, bringing it down, you know? So right. what have you tried destroy to destroy your confidence yeah, and so, still shame? Uh-huh. Right. So I like to focus on, you know, what cool thing have you, have you tried that's outside of your comfort zone this week? That's, mm-hmm. that's been scary, but you did it and you were successful no matter how small it is. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So I think there's, um, that subclinical area, I see a lot of it in what I do and uh, who I talk to and who I work with. So thank you so much for that, for that bit, because I know that most of your work is eating disorder treatment, whereas this is the prevention work. This is right. This, like, let's not right. raise the next generation of young women who are obsessed with. Yeah, that's body. the 85%. Yeah. You know, that's the 85% of people who aren't satisfied. And yes, there is no perfection. We live in these imperfect bodies, you know, and, but they are what they are and we're built the way we're built and we have the genetics that we have. And, you know, how can we be as healthy and treat ourselves kindly and, you know, not continue to heap on shame because that never helps someone live better. Right. No, never. I'm so, I'm so glad that we have those points brought up. I think that's really important. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap this interview up? Wow. I I don't know. I like the questions you've asked though, because it has prompted me to think about, you know, important little nuggets along the way. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. What about you? What do you think? Other questions Mm -hmm. about it? Well, I know one thing. So for example, if I'm a, let's just kind of pivot for a second and talk about like the clinical, if I am a a new therapist or maybe I'm a seasoned therapist and I really want to learn more about how to help folks with eating disorders, where would you point them to go to learn more? 
Well, I think, you know, there's always great trainings these days, online trainings, and I think you're doing this and contributing to that body of work. I also think that, too, I am more than happy, like if someone in our community calls up and says, oh, I have a patient with an eating disorder, will you see him? You know, I'm busy enough, and I would rather teach you how to see them because you have a relationship already established with that client. Mm-hmm. And can we consult or can you and your client come over to me or me go to you and um, let's all sit to, down together. Of course, you and I were trained in a consultation model like that, mm-hmm. but I would love nothing more, you know, right here in South Carolina to train every therapist in South Carolina here to be competent in treating eating disorders, you know, I don't, I don't need to corner the market. I'm not competitive in that way. And I would rather train people than carry the burden of seeing every one of these individuals with an eating disorder. So, and I think a lot of people would be willing to consult Mm -hmm. and there are great trainings that go on all the time. Yeah, that's very true. There's a lot out there now. There's also, I I mean, I don't know what you think about this, but there's also trainings out there about uh, nutrition and mental health, mm-hmm. how nutrition affects our thinking and in our behavior. I mean, it's pretty, pretty cool that there's so much out there right now that you can really find a niche and mm-hmm. really go for it. I, I think mm-hmm. that, that's really cool. I'm actually thinking about getting a, a certification in nutrition and mental health, just, mm-hmm. just to have that knowledge of being able to say, you know, this food is actually better for, for you in when you're dealing with symptoms of depression, or if you're anxious, right. you know, try this recipe for whatever. I mean, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. all a one size fit all. And it's not like that recipe is going to fix your anxiety, but we're all, you know, body, mind, and spirit. It's, it all plays in together. And you, like you said, the five domains, you have to bring it all together. Right. And I, I do think as um, a therapist who works with people with eating disorders, you have to have some good basic knowledge. You know, mm-hmm. I have enough now, obviously work with a dietitian or several dietitians, but, you know, I have to know what I'm talking about and not rely on the, you know, the latest little, you know, bit of whatever that's come out in the media or social media, but to actually know some good, solid, basic things about general nutrition and general health and, you know, keep a perspective on that. It's, it is the way that it challenges the clinician to be eclectic in that way. Well, that's for sure. One thing we know, folks who are dealing with eating disorders are challenging, but like Mm -hmm. you said earlier, it's not that they mean to be challenging. It's just a symptom of the disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom of our culture too, you know? So if people want more Dr. Ray and Mark, where do they go to find more about more you? (laughs) Oh, wow. You know, I don't know. That's a good question. So, (laughs) well, I do have a blog that I wrote for three years with a colleague of mine in town. It's called Life is Messy, Life is Marvelous. And Mm -hmm. it's actually now found, we've changed our domain site, but it's now found at messymarvelous.com. And it's a skill-based blog. We used to publish every Monday morning a skill for dealing with life's messes in order to make your life more marvelous. And my friend, Dr. Amy Montanez and I alternated weeks on that. So every other week, roughly I wrote and she wrote on the weeks in between. And so that's where you can read, I think a lot more just about my general philosophy of life and musings. And yet there's always a skill for, you know, how to better handle life because it's messy for all of us. And I do teach at the university and and have a private practice. And um, I do have a website, but I'm really fairly inactive on it. (laughs) So everybody's always like, you know, the only thing worse than not having a website is having an inactive one. And mine is terribly inactive right now. So that's okay. My hope is we'll bring you back in the future. And maybe we can talk some more about family systems and eating disorders. We can really kind of get into them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that would be really cool for our listeners. And you have a range of expertise. So I know that some abnormal psych stuff, maybe some marriage and family stuff. So mm-hmm. I would love to bring you back and do some more. This has been great. 
Yeah, I do a lot of couples work. I have a very general practice. And um, one of the things I've enjoyed learning a whole lot more about in the last several years has been working with athletes. So I do work mm-hmm. with some of the athletes down at the university. And um, that's just been a delightful, unexpected thing to add to the mix. And I think it's what I love about the field is, you know, we never stop learning and always have the opportunity to sort of reinvent ourselves, you know, get bored with what you're doing, do something else. You're the queen of that, right? Hello. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You Maybe. are extremely uh, skilled in that. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, sometimes to a fault, I can get myself in trouble because I have all so many ideas. But this has been by far my favorite idea is that I get to interview seasoned clinicians that are doing some really cool stuff and have amazing base of knowledge. And we can just share it with other therapists who who want to just listen in and maybe they or maybe they need to see you or they can purchase this pod course or maybe you are a student and you're not sure what you want to do and you're thinking about being Mm -hmm. a therapist, you know, I love to share stories of, that's why I ask, you know, how did you get into this? Cause I think it's Mm -hmm. really fascinating how people decide to come into this work. So once again, I am just so grateful and excited to have interviewed you today. This has been a joy and a pleasure and I'm excited about future interviews that that we can do. So thank you again. Great. It was fun, Lisa, as always, it's always great to see your face. Good to see you too. So (laughs) Thank you for listening to The Therapy Show. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamuster.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the podcast. Thank you.